Dottie releases. A mirror hangs above a bent and broken sink. In a fierce discharge of masculine energy, someone has ripped half the faucet off. Hot water sprays from the base and steam covers the mirror. You cannot see yourself, just the outline of a man. Suddenly, you realize you have no memory of the face that awaits you there, underneath the soft vapor. Really, all recollection of the person you are the people in your life and even the world you're in has drowned in a sea of blood alcohol. This was no mere night of drinking. It was a deluge of world-ending proportions. As you slowly reach your hand towards the surface of the mirror, behold, you have no idea who this thing is, do you? Too late. You clearly have rigor mortis on your face. Oh wait, is that an expression? Are you trying to make an expression with that face? Why? Please stop. It's horrible. You're scaring yourself. You can't, can you? It's like it's not even voluntary anymore. You have worn that grin into your face and now it won't come off. What does it even mean? What is the emotion you're trying to convey? You should check yourself for a pulse, because from here it looks like a cadaverous spasm. You find no sign of life on your swollen neck. However, putting your hand on your chest reveals an irregular heartbeat. You appear to be alive, for now. It belongs in the new, the third decade of the current century. Enough time had passed from the failure of the revolution that, for a fleeting moment, Free market economy seemed like the ultimate, uncontested way of life for our species. Things were good. It was smooth sailing. People made gold and champagne tinted interiors and facades to suit the times, calling this the new style. But more importantly, disco happened. For Revachol, your city, that meant only one thing. Guillaume La Million. If it doesn't rhyme, you're not pronouncing it right. Out of the dazzling swirl of disco music, in an open air, Boite de Nuit, somewhere in Revachol West, Guillaume's blonde mane appeared on the screen. He sang some bullshit. Then he made the expression. It doesn't have to be. You can swoon over Guillaume and his champagne cork smile whenever you want to. Maybe some of the stardust will return. This fan has two chain pull switches. One ends in a tiny fan, the other in a light bulb. A truly horrific necktie has somehow attached itself to one of the blades. You swoop up and catch the tie. Snap, it's released from the blade. What you have in your hand is a truly hideous necktie, 
with four or five different patterns. The knot reminds you of a noose. You hear a jingle. Keys are clinking in the pocket of your flare cut pants. It says whirling in rags on the aluminium key ring. There is a single key on the ring. The number one is etched on it. It should open the door. The whirling in rags is a hostel cafeteria on the urban coast, frequented by dock workers. Officer. The young woman raises a cigarette to her lips. Her eyes are brown and her face is speckled with birthmarks. She can't be more than 28. A silver jumpsuit falls off her like scale armor, sparkling. This is the sparkle of too many nights out on the city. Uh... No. The young woman shakes her head slowly. Officer could be an artistic statement, a claim to official renown. No, you're a police officer, sir. I am, yes. Unless you've been feeding us a set of very well-rehearsed lies all this time. You've been here for three days. On official police business, no less. I couldn't say. In truth, so far, mostly drinking. You have no doubt about the drinking. But do you strike yourself as a tight-lipped drunk? She must have heard something. Could it be because of the drinking? She hasn't had time to put her makeup on. This is her morning cigarette. She looks tired, her beauty waning faster than it ought to at her age. She nods. There's a mercenary out back. He's been hanged. The body has been there for a week now. The locals probably got tired of it and called the cops. I didn't mean to overwhelm you with information. You seem a bit... lost, officer. Of course. Be careful, officer. They don't like the police around here. Something stirs in you as she's about to go. Call it an instinct, a need. The need to ask questions. It's like you said the words a million times before. She looks back at you, a light glinting off her eyes. Yes? There was the usual ruckus. Loud disco music. I couldn't say. It's impossible to hear people speaking from over here. Yeah? The dock workers are pretty cocky. They think they're police enough. At least here on the coast. I can't say about the rest of the city. You're in a hostel, sir. We are in Revachol. Revachol is the disgraced former capital of the world, divided into zones of control under foreign occupation. Half a century after a failed world revolution, she is central to our moment in time. You sure look like you're from Revachol. Revachol parties. Her accent suggests she is not from around here. She's from Aranye, another part of the world. It's 51. The current century? Centuries don't have numbers. They have names. And this is the current one. 
Civilization has existed for 8,000 years, sir. You're right. There is nothing funny about civilization. Glad to have been of assistance. The door is closed. A man in his late twenties stands behind the counter, inspecting a stuffed seabird. As you approach, he gives you a sideways glance, then looks down again. Everything is cool between you and this guy. He's a big fan. Make some small talk. No, I'm not the bartender. I'm the cafeteria manager. He's very animated all of a sudden. This seems like a touchy subject. Mm -hmm. A competent work of taxidermy. The white and brown seabird lies among piles of coasters and drying mugs. One of its wings broken. The man is trying to mend it. Looks like the bird was ripped off the shield that was used to mount it. Most likely on a wall. This is the great skewer. The seabird is the symbol for the discovery of the Insulindian Isola, the part of the world you are in right now. The small steel tag says as much. The great skewer. Stercoarius skewer. Look, your buddy is over there. Why don't you go and talk to him, okay? He pretends not to hear you concentrating on the bird instead. You should totally sing karaoke here, the first chance you get. Your emotions need to be expressed. People need to know your vast oceanic soul. Utterly, and it needs to be heard through a PA system by other people. Who is mistakenly identified as a cop for his prominent jawline? Yes, sounds likely. You should probably go on stage and pose for a moment when you're done with this thought. See if it works. You have not yet stumbled on the right lamentation, but it's out there. It'll come to you. You will wreak havoc with it. Don't worry. Serves them right. Wipe that smirk off their face with your sad, tragic song. Who's laughing now? No one. You have to find something tragic to sing first, though. A 
a bespectacled man in an orange bomber jacket is tapping his foot on the floor. Looks like he's waiting for someone. You. As you approach, he narrows his eyes and extends his hand in greeting. On the sleeve of his bomber jacket, as well as on its back, are the same enigmatic white rectangles as on your blazer. Hello. I'm Kim Kitsuragi, Lieutenant, Prison 57. You must be from the 41st. You realize he is waiting for your name. Concentration makes you squint your eyes. Your name should be deep gold and orange, like a forest fire looming on the horizon, but mixed with the stench of liquor rising from your breath. You're two steps closer to it, but there are still many to go. Very well, officer. It looks like we had a little scheduling error on Sunday. Saturday too, actually. Have you had time to talk to the manager here? What he means is, he has been trying to meet up with you for two days, but you have been otherwise occupied. If you don't mind, we should talk to him again. Ask him for a rundown of the area. Now that I'm here as well. I understand the scene is out back, right? It also wouldn't hurt to assure him the police are finally here. In full force, I mean. Have you mapped out the initial interviews? Okay, we'll have time for that after we take a look at the coroner's case. Have you removed the dead body from the tree? So, the body is still in the tree, where it has been hanging for seven days straight. We should go there as soon as we are done talking to the owner. I can see you drank last night and the night before, and that you are still drunk now. But I have seen officers go through worse, much worse. If you need something for your headache, there is a general store nearby. But as I said, the dead body should be our number one concern. After you, officer. If you're about to embark on an investigation, shouldn't you have a badge? You mean you don't have a badge? Losing your identification card is a serious matter. My vehicle has a shortwave. You can use it to report your badge missing. I advise you to try to locate it as quickly as possible. But getting the body down should still take precedence. There they both are, two identical shoes, both copiously green and indiscriminately snakeskin, reused like two baby crocodiles. Go ahead, just as long as you don't discard those crocodile babies. several footprints in the mud, left by work boots. Anywhere from six to twelve peers have walked here. Maybe more than twelve. No, 
eight pairs of boots have shuffled back and forth in the mud. One, standard work boot, steel reinforced toes, number 46. Two, standard work boot, steel reinforced toes, number 44. Three, hobnailed work boot, steel reinforced toes, number 43. Four, standard work boot, number 45 or 46. You don't know. It's a miracle you can tell the prints apart as it is. The cold must have preserved them. Five, another standard work boot, steel reinforced toes, number 44. Six, an aberration, light as air, even pace, same make of boot, but number 41. Impossible to tell. Could also have been an adolescent. The gait is undeveloped. You're not bad. It's as if the whole world darkens. Everything else has a thin film of unimportance on it, and the tracks burn in the middle of it in a strange, beautiful way. 7. The glowing outline of a standard work boot, number 46, but the imprints are twice as deep as the others. The weight exceeds 200 kilograms. 8. And yet another standard work boot, number 44. There's an aberration in the pattern of the sole, however. The right sole is smoother, more worn. How many? I was pretty off then. I counted 20. I never got the hang of it. Hyperopia. Do you see anything out of the ordinary? Two hundred? Could it be the combined weight of two people, one carrying the other who's tied up? Let's say a heavily built worker carrying a similarly built, soon-to-be-dead man. He might be right. Two hundred kilograms of living weight is unlikely. Possibly, yes. But why? Yes, they could have used the makeshift stretcher or just march him up to the gallows. You have a point there. Anyway, it's something to consider. What else can you see? Interesting. Let's name it the old soul. Someone operating a workbench with a pedal? Like a joiner at the harbour. Or maybe a drummer? No, it's not. Forget I said it. We are not looking for a drummer. Perhaps it could be a driver. A driver would wear out the right shoe before the left. The accelerator is on the right. He doesn't seem to hear you, looking south toward the traffic jam instead. The machines are silent. The engines are all turned off. We should keep our eyes open around the traffic jam, see whether anyone strikes out as a potential suspect. Seems... Mm -hmm. A woman or a kid? Okay, how do you know? He knows it's hard to discern sex from a person's gait. Understood. Anything else? A week, maybe? Seven days would fit the time frame provided to us by the caller, who reported the hanging. It is not impossible. I pulled last week's forecast for coastal Havashol. Seven days below freezing. The day before, the day of his hanging, was the last warm day. Correct again. Sub-zero temperatures would preserve the tracks in a good state. The commotion here could have taken place a week ago. What do I think? A mob of people brought something heavy to the tree. One of them was carrying the victim. They shuffled around, especially under the tree. Then, after hoisting him up, they stood in a semicircle facing his direction. At first glance, this appears to be a lynching. Indeed. They all stood in a row here and looked at the tree. Yes, everything fits so well. Carried him over, hoisted him up, watched him hang. This is easy. The lieutenant's eyes narrow. He's thinking to himself. Either way, what else? The 
corpse looks at you with bulging white eyes. The face around them does not look human. It's swollen and ready to burst. His lips are fish-like and his tongue like a ball gag in his mouth. You seem to be holding your breath. A cargo belt twists his neck at an unnatural angle. The body below appears stiff. It's letting out an ungodly rot. The smell seeps in even through your clenched nostrils. Active decay. It's okay to throw up, officer. No one is judging. He's about to blow! Cop's gonna blow, Kuno! The smell is repulsive. It pushes in from your mouth, more instant and more familiar than anything you'd expected, more fever than odor. It fills your mind, flushing you from within. <coughs> Too late. It's impossible to keep in. Your body curls and pushes it out, burst by burst, until a pool of vomit lies under your feet and your throat stings from the stomach acid. The smell of Commodore Red rises from the pool. Among it, distilled spirit and bits of shish kebab. It's okay. Happens to everyone. Keep it. The hangover is clearly making this worse for you. You could use some ammonia to clear your head. There is Frit nearby, east of the hostel. They usually have a small apothecary. If they don't... There's a greenhouse here, and a gardener with a wheelbarrow on the corner of the whirling in rags. If she works here, she might have something for the smell. Hmm. Pretty clever. <laughs> 